morning, everyone. Glad you could join us for worship here this morning. And I know we're all kind of uh, operating with one less hour in the last 24 hours, um, but uh, I'm sure we'll get through it, right? Um, why don't we just take a moment to um, calm our hearts um, as we uh, as we gather together. Let me pray. Father, we um, just ask that as we come before you this morning, Lord, um, you would help us to just put aside those things that might be uh, distracting for us. Um, I ask that you would visit us now with your spirit. Um, and Lord, we want to just honor you and praise you through our lips, through this whole entire worship service this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. stand. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing
splendor of the King. The splendor of the King. Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how Above. Name above all names, worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. Name above. our God. Amen. You were the Word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high.
sin was great, your love was greater. Oh, what could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of King of kings and Lord of lords, uh, and you have victory over the grave. You have victory over sin and death. And we, um, we just want to praise and lift your name on high this morning. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your spirit, your presence here. And we pray that you would speak to us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's remain standing and uh, recite the Apostles' Creed to affirm our faith. I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the grave and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and thence shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. All right, you may be seated. All right, we have a few announcements to run through this morning. And I'm flying a little blind, but I'll try to remember <laughs> them off the top of my head. Uh, we do have a uh, youth uh, meeting this Friday, as usual. We're meeting at 7.30. We have spiritual formation, so um, looking forward to that. Uh, so make a note of that for the youth group. Um, I believe we have announcement for <laughs> Oh, for the lunch service, thank you. So. Um, I was really encouraged last week to see everybody helping out there. So um, once again, we are going to be um, on a lunch service due today. So after service, uh, if we could have some help setting up tables um, and then serving food and cleaning up afterwards, uh, that'd be appreciated. Is it youth next? 
Um, yeah, so next um, is the youth retreat coming up at the end of this month. Um, just wanted to, we've been announcing this a lot, but just wanted to remind you um, for pay, uh, for the uh, sending payment for that, please um, send a or give a check or cash to Grace or Agnes. Um, and yeah, we're really excited about the youth retreat. It's going to be a great opportunity for for us to uh, kind of build community and um, and hear from God. Uh, oh, Good Friday is coming up. Uh, on the 29th, and we do have uh, for this year separate worship services for um, the Chinese and English congregations. Uh, so that will be meeting at our regular time, but we will be meeting upstairs here in the in the sanctuary for the other side. So um, welcome to come and invite your friends as well. And then I think we have one more announcement for Jenny. I'll invite her up to do that for the uh, for Easter. Good morning, CEC family. Uh, we have a quick announcement. There's a lot that's coming up for children's ministry, but the first thing that's coming up on our calendar is our annual Easter explosions. And this is for our kids' toddlers through fifth grade. And so all kids are welcome, all families are welcome. And this will be held on Sunday, um, March 31st, which is Easter Sunday. And so we'll do this from 10 to 1045 right before our service. Um, but this will be a fun um, event for our kids and for our families, for them to come celebrate this joyous day with us. We have Easter egg hunting. We have Easter crafts. We have a special Easter service for our kids. And if you have any families or friends or neighbors in town um, that you want to invite th uh, them to, this is a great uh, event for that. And it's a great opportunity for you to bring um, those people with you to um, our Easter explosion and um, encourage them to stay afterwards to join us for our Easter service that the adults will have it, uh, be having as well. And so um, this event is coming up in a couple weeks. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to um, contact me. You can always reach me through email or in person. Um, we do need volunteers from both youth and adults. Um, there's different ways you can serve for this specific event. We have uh, many different stations. We need greeters. Uh, we even need people to come and maybe help us set up the day before. Um, and so if this is you, if you're available and you're interested in serving in this way, please come join our team. You can come talk to me about that. But we're excited to celebrate Easter with you all. And uh, kids, I hope you guys are excited too. Thank you, Jenny. Um, and thanks, Wayne, for the announcement cues. Uh, we're going to have a time of just fellowship right now. So if you would stand. Um, Say hi to each other, and then kind of we have some snacks in the back. And in a few minutes, we'll invite you back um, for the worship service, for the sermon. And kids are dismissed, yes. With you. And let's turn to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. We're going to start today at verse 12. So I'll give you a minute to find Acts chapter 5, verse 12. While you're turning there... I uh, just want to say that on Easter Sunday, uh, at the end of this month, we will actually have joint worship service with the Chinese congregation, and it will be downstairs. Okay, so if you come upstairs, there will not be anybody here. You'll be all by yourself. So don't do that. Instead, go downstairs. Everything will be translated. The songs, the sermon, uh, the prayers, everything will be translated uh, in both English and Chinese, and we'll have a combined worship service at 11 o'clock on Easter morning. Uh, if uh, you are not baptized and you are interested in being baptized, we will be doing baptisms on Easter morning. Um, I probably need a decision uh, if you want to be baptized within a week to a week and a half, two weeks at the most, okay? Uh, because we're coming up on a deadline. So if you are not yet baptized, but you are a follower of Jesus, that I'd like to invite you to, uh, to pray about that. All right, Acts chapter 5. We're picking up uh, where we left off last week, which was at verse 12. You might recall that last week's text was really heavy. Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit, and they dropped dead in the church. Um, and everybody was afraid. And that's how the text ended last week. 
So here we pick up in verse 12, where it says, Many signs and wonders were being done among the people through the hands of the apostles. They were all together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared to join them, but the people spoke well of them. Believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers, multitudes of both men and women. As a result, they would carry the sick out into the streets and lay them on cots and mats, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. In addition, a multitude came together from the towns surrounding Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Then the high priest rose up. He and all who were with him, who belonged to the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. So they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail during the night, brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and tell the people all about this life. Hearing this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. When the high priest and those who were with him arrived, they convened the Sanhedrin, the full council of the Israelites, and sent orders to the jail to have them brought. But when the servants got there, they did not find them in the jail, so they returned and reported. We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing in front of the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. As the captain of the temple police and the chief priests heard these things, they were baffled about them, wondering what would come of this. Someone came and reported to them, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the commander went with the servants and brought them in without force because they were afraid the people might stone them. After they brought them in, they had them stand before the Sanhedrin, and the high priest asked, Didn't we strictly order you not to teach in this name? Look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than people. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had murdered by hanging him on a tree. God exalted this man to his right hand as ruler and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was respected by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be taken outside for a little while. He said to them, Men of Israel, be careful about what you're about to do to these men. Some time ago, Judas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed and all his followers were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and attracted a following. He also perished, and all his followers were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or this work is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even be found fighting against God. They were persuaded by him. After they called in the apostles and had them flogged, they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and released them. Then they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. Every day in the temple and in various homes, they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would encounter your son through this text, that we would be transformed into his likeness by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Spirit, that you would draw all men and women to the son even now. In your name we pray, amen. You know, it can be easy to be discouraged about the progress of the church. Some churches are discouraged because of personality conflicts. Some churches are discouraged uh, because of sin struggles, disagreements about everything from politics to the color of the carpet in the sanctuary. Some churches are discouraged because of staff turnover. Some of us here perhaps feel the sting of not having a youth pastor that we have been searching for for over a year. 
It's easy to be discouraged by that gap. Some churches are discouraged because there are fewer people attending in a post-COVID world. Other churches are discouraged because it seems like Christianity's influence is fading in our society. And yet, this text provides hope for the church of Jesus Christ because it demonstrates that Jesus is building his church yesterday, today, tomorrow. And our confidence is not in pastors or programs or buildings or budgets. Our confidence is is in the risen Lord. In this passage, right on the heels of Ananias and Sapphira's untimely death, we read that there are these signs and wonders being performed through the power of the apostles. It's the power of Jesus, ultimately, but it's being unleashed on the city of Jerusalem through the hands of the apostles, and it's some pretty incredible stuff. You might have listened as or read as I was reading this text that people from all over Jerusalem were coming to be healed. People were bringing their, their friends and laying their cots down so that even if Peter walked by, maybe his shadow would fall on the sick person laying on the cot and that Peter's shadow might transform their bodies, that Peter's shadow perhaps might bring healing. Now, it doesn't exactly say in this text that Peter's shadow actually had that effect, but that people thought it did. I think it's probably a fair inference that the reason why people thought that was because it was actually happening. And honestly, um, even though that can be hard to believe, I mean, we're, we're raised in the scientific age, right? A lot of you are pharmacists, doctors. You, you have been to medical school. You know how healing transpires, and it doesn't come through a shadow. That's what we know through the scientific method. But have you ever read the Bible cover to cover? There's quite a few eyebrow-raising stories in here of a donkey who talks because he sees an angel, of a, of a God who makes the first people out of dirt of a man who brings himself back from the grave. You see, there are, there are plenty of stories in the Bible that confound our imaginations. But I have decided that there are very good reasons for believing those other stories. If you have doubts about those, we can, we can talk about them. In fact, I invite you to. All questions are fair game. But if I believe that Jesus resurrected himself from the dead on Easter morning, then the idea that Peter's shadow could heal people is not as far-fetched as it seems. And there was incredible signs and wonders being done, bearing witness to the fact that Jesus was alive. And this was a powerful potent symbol of the fact that Jesus was no longer in the grave. That's what everybody in Jerusalem thought. This, this Messiah figure, this would-be prophet, this kind of this uh, guy who was trying to, trying to stir up trouble, that's what, every, that's what the religious leaders thought. He's, he's good and dead now. We finished him off. There's going to be no more trouble from the Galileans. That's why it was so alarming and so confounding for the religious leaders to get wind of these reports. People are being healed in the city. The streets are being jam-packed with people who are bringing their friends on their cots and saying, Peter, John, would you heal them? And then they hear the stories about Peter's shadow. And it begins to rattle the establishment. It begins to rattle the religious leaders this is not what they wanted they thought that by killing jesus and by putting a guard at the tomb that they could dispense with this galilean messiah this rabbi from the north but it seems 
that not only did Jesus not want to stay in the tomb, his followers don't want to stay quiet. Now, I've referenced the religious leaders. There can be a, a somewhat overwhelming array of religious leaders mentioned in this text. So let me, let me kind of tick through them real quick, just so you know who's who. If you're, if you're watching a new TV show and the different characters come on screen, uh, a lot of times they'll do like flashbacks so you get the backstory. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about who these various characters are, okay? Mentioned in this chapter, there are the Pharisees. The Pharisees are oftentimes thought of as priests, but they're not priests. They are, uh, they're sort of like religious uh, lay leaders. So they're not, they're not like the pastors, if you will. They are lay leaders who have a deep devotion to the law of God. The law of God is from the Old Testament. It's, it's, uh, it's the Torah. They are really committed to following that law. But the Pharisees are so devoted to following the law that they go well beyond what the law says. So, in other words, if the law says you, you can't go over there, they would build a, a fence over here. And they would say, the new rule is you can't go over here. Because in their minds, what they're thinking is, if you stop here, you'll never get to the sin over here. As a, as a matter of psychology, maybe that makes sense. But the problem was that they would then say it's a sin to go past here. But was that what the law of God said? No, that was not what the law of God said. And this is one of the reasons why Jesus was so fierce in his denunciation of the Pharisees. They were binding the conscience of God's people by saying, this is the rule, this is the law, you can't go any farther than this, and that was a man-made law rather than a God-made law. But the Pharisees had some good points to them. They were very zealous, very focused on personal piety and holiness. They sometimes focused on the wrong things, but they were this group of leaders who really focused on God's law. What about the Sadducees? They're also mentioned in this chapter. The Sadducees are more of an elite group. Uh, the, um, they're a politically dominant group in Israel. Uh, so, you know, sometimes uh, we tend to kind of just have like a Jesus storybook version of these, uh, of these events, and we kind of sanitize it and strip all of the drama out of it. Uh, but in reality, there were these different factions in Jerusalem jockeying for position and power. Ultimately, Caesar was in charge. Rome had taken over Israel. That was done. Every once in a while, there would be some rebel who would maybe claim to be the Messiah, lead a revolt, and then Rome would squash him. That's actually referenced uh, in this text, a guy named Theudas. But in general, Rome was in charge, and, and the, the Jewish people, while they were waiting for Messiah, they just had to make the most of it. And they had different opinions about how to make the most of it. The Sadducees had risen to power. They were the ones who were the most politically dominant group in Jerusalem. And one of the ways they got to power was they made bargains with Rome. They made deals with Rome. A unique thing about the Sadducees is that they did not believe in the idea of resurrection. Not just Jesus' resurrection, anybody's resurrection. They did not believe in future resurrection. They did not believe in angelic spirits. So there's a number of like distinctive beliefs about this particular group. And they have a bit of a majority. I don't know exactly the numbers. It was not an overwhelming majority, but they did have uh, the most votes in what's called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is another uh, group, another term in this text that you might not be familiar with. The Sanhedrin was the governing council in Jerusalem. It was like a cross between um, the Supreme Court and the town council, all right? So it's like somewhat legal and somewhat political, and they're, they're mixed together, and the Sanhedrin is a group of about 70 guys governed by the high priest. We'll come to him in a second. 70 guys in the high priest that make legal and judicial and religious decrees for God's people. All knowing that technically Caesar is in charge, and, and, but he's given the Jewish people a lot of 
leeway for how they conduct their business. So long as they pay their taxes, um, they can get away with a lot. So you've got the Pharisees, you've got the Sadducees, you've got the Sanhedrin, and then I mentioned the high priest. Uh, the high priest was sort of the de facto leader of the Sanhedrin, and um, there was a, an entire class of, of priests who would do all kinds of different religious duties in the temple. Uh, there were priests who had to take care of the sacrifices. There were daily sacrifices that would be offered. There were priests that would have to, have to um, take care of all different functions of teaching people and taking care of the sacrifices, taking care of the temple. But then there was one guy, the high priest. He was the, the leader of the priests. And once a year, on something called the Day of Atonement, he would enter into the most sacred space in the temple and stand before the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Jewish people believed that God's glory resided within the Ark of the Covenant. It wasn't just a, like a, a magical talisman in something like uh, you know the old Indiana Jones movies, but it was, it was something real and powerful and potent, and God lived in this box. The Ark of the Covenant. And God would sort of localize his presence within the Ark of the Covenant, maybe because to see God is to die. People in the Old Testament, they, they could not survive their encounters between the glory of God. So God instead chooses to live within the Ark of the Covenant. And the high priest, once a year, on the Day of Atonement, he enters into this most sacred space and he offers a sacrifice. An animal gives its life to cover and atone for the sins of all the people. It's a, it's a generic covering. Every sin that we have committed as a people, as a nation, every sin we have committed in the last year, this animal is symbolically bearing our guilt and our shame. And God, within the Ark of the Covenant, would accept that sacrifice on behalf of his people and their sins would be covered, not removed, not forgiven, but covered. The Bible says that the blood of bulls and of goats could not take away sin. That's why the perfect Lamb of God would come to take away the sins of the world. That was the high priest's main job. He did other things, but mainly on the Day of Atonement, what he's most known for is he would go stand before God and offer that annual sacrifice for God's people. So these are the players in this drama in Acts chapter 5. You've got the apostles who we've met. We know about them. We know about these early Christians. There's several thousand of them at this point. Not everything is going well because Ananias and Sapphira have just dropped dead and people are scared. And at the beginning of this text, it says that people don't want to commit themselves to the church because people drop dead in the worship service. You might think twice about going to church if that was what was happening regularly. But then the next couple of verses say that, but actually other people did believe. So apparently there were some people who wanted to be like Ananias and Sapphira. They wanted to have a hypocritical version of Christianity that presents on church, on church days like you got your act together and everything's good, but then live like a non-Christian the rest of the week. That didn't work for Ananias and Sapphira. There was a cost to that. And so those kind of people who wanted to have that kind of Christianity, they shrink back from committing to the community. But those who genuinely believe, those who count the cost to follow Jesus, commit themselves in large numbers in the community is growing rapidly, but it leads to controversy with all of these various religious factions and groups we've just described. Um, the high priest comes with probably some of his temple uh, soldiers. There were special soldiers and special guards whose job it was to preserve, be sort of like the police force for the temple. They arrive to arrest the apostles. They go lock them in jail. It's, uh, it's almost like recycling back through a similar version of the same story again, because this happened in chapter four. 
uh, they're locked up again, and uh, their idea is that we're going to put them, put them on ice overnight. We'll talk to them in the morning. Problem was, an angel of the Lord comes, and he lets out the apostles, and he gives them a command to go to the temple and bear witness to Jesus. So that's what they do. Verse 21 says that they entered the temple at daybreak and they began to teach. Uh, somebody pointed out that in the Mediterranean world, uh, life begins at daybreak, at the dawn. Uh, people did not have clocks that automatically knew when daylight savings time kicked on and off. They were old school and they just went by the sun. And so when the sun was up, Jewish people began their life. And usually what they would do is many of them would gather in the temple on their way to work for pre-work prayers. So you go into the temple, you offer your prayer, and then you head to work. The sun is up, so it's time to go to the temple, say your prayers, and then head to work, wherever, whatever you did for work. And so at daybreak, the apostles who spent the night in prison can be found in the temple at the time of morning prayers to speak God's word to the people. And uh, the captain and the, uh, of the temple police and the chief priests are hearing about these things and finding that the doors of the jail are still locked. The guards are still standing there guarding an empty sail. They have no idea that there's nobody in the jail. Because the, the leaders, the Sanhedrin, in the morning they say, yeah, go get the prisoners. We want to we wanna talk to them. We want to tell them not to talk about Jesus. But the captain of the temple police says, I, I can't find them. They're not in the, in, in the jail. The jail is empty. The soldiers are still guarding it. And they don't remember anything weird happening last night, but the prison's empty. And then another messenger comes and says, I think the guys you're looking for are in the temple preaching, which I'm sure was not a well-received message. It was, a, it was an honor-shame culture, and they were being shamed in front of the local population. They were not able to save face in this moment because the people that they were intending to shame were bearing witness to the one that they had killed. The Sanhedrin loses face and they're quite embarrassed. So they go get them one more time. They grab them from the temple. They're probably in the middle of preaching a sermon at the time of morning prayers and, and they're, they're brought forcibly to go meet with the Sanhedrin. But they're careful how they do it because the guards and the soldiers are worried about being stoned by the people. This shows that there was a lot of like popular uh, sympathy towards the Christian movement. The opposition to Christianity in the first century was more an establishment thing. It was, the, it was the religious and political leaders in Jerusalem that were opposed to Christianity. The people were much more sympathetic. After all, Peter's shadow had healed their cousin. Peter's shadow had healed their friend. They didn't really care what the Sadducees said. They didn't care about how the Sadducees said, this is not good for our, our political relationship with the Roman Empire. They didn't care about any of that. They just said, but this guy's shadow healed people that I love. You're telling me this isn't real? So they wouldn't get stoned by the crowds. These guards kind of like gently and kindly removed them and brought them before the Sanhedrin, this group of 70 men. I don't know if every single man had been rounded up. It says the entire uh, council, that might, that might be a, uh, an, an expression, a way of talking about how all parts of the council were represented. But whether it's all 70 guys or not, they're having this really important meeting to judge what are we going to do with the apostles. And they tell them, look, we don't want you to talk about these guys anymore. Didn't we strictly order you, they say in verse 28, not to teach in this name? We sang about that earlier. What a beautiful name it is. 
what a powerful name it is. There's something significant about the name, the name Jesus. Back in Acts chapter 4, the apostles said, there is no other name by which we can be saved. It is the name of Jesus that is of most consequence. It is the name of Jesus that literally divides history. B.C. and A.D., before Christ or in the year of our Lord. Didn't we tell you not to teach this name? Didn't we tell you not to say this? You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. We cannot save face as long as you keep preaching this name. And Peter and the apostles paraphrased Socrates. Socrates was this uh, Greek philosopher who had been on trial and um, he had a chance to save his life if he just recanted his views. Now, he wasn't a Christian. I'm not at all saying he was a Christian, but he had these views and he was offered a chance to recant. And he said something to the effect of, I have to obey God rather than people. The exact quote is, Athenians, I honor and love you, but I shall obey the God rather than you. Now, everybody in the ancient world knew this story. They knew about Socrates. They knew about how he died. They knew about how he thought that there was some supreme being. He didn't realize who that was. So Socrates is, is not one of us. But he thought that there was some supreme being up there. And he had to obey him. The apostles paraphrase Socrates. And when they do, everybody listening would have known instantly what story they were referring to. Everybody reading this story for the first time in the first century, when Luke compiles this narrative, they would understand that this is an echo of a famous trial in Athens. Peter and John and James and the apostles are taking their stand upon that which is true. And they're appealing to God. Remember, they've been told not to preach in the name. And then when they say, well, we'd rather obey God rather than people, one of the implications of that is that the name, Jesus, maps onto God. You see, Socrates said, I, I will obey the God. He didn't really know who it was or what it was, but there's something up there that I want to obey. Peter and John have greater clarity than Socrates and they say, the name for us, the name of Jesus is synonymous with God and it is better to obey God than people. So they're going farther and beyond what Socrates said and nobody listening would have missed the force of that. Everybody was pretty clear on what was being said. And Peter, in verse 30, and the apostles replied, the God of our ancestors raised up Jesus whom you had murdered by hanging him on a tree. God exalted this man to his right hand as ruler and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. There's a number of important ideas expressed in this brief statement. It's not quite a sermon, but it's, a, it's like a three or four line statement that is packed more packed than most of my sermons. Uh, he, Peter acknowledges that they're continuing the story of the Old Testament. As a Jewish man, he's speaking to Jewish religious leaders. And what does he do? He appeals to the God of our ancestors. What Peter is saying is, look, we're not saying anything really new and different. We haven't gone and found one of the, the gods of the, of the Greek or Roman world or the gods of Persia or Babylon. No, 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 no. We're focused on the God of our ancestors. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The God that made the world. The God of Elijah and Elisha. The God of Moses. The God of Aaron. The God of our ancestors. We have not departed from the faith. Instead, we have just figured out the name. And what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had murdered. This gets at the idea of resurrection, which would have really troubled the majority of the Sanhedrin. As I said, 
The Sadducees had a, had a voting edge. I don't know how much, but they had a voting edge in the Sanhedrin. And they did not believe in the resurrection. That doesn't affect Peter's speech, though. He says, in spite of the fact that it would be unpopular, the God of our ancestors has raised up this Jesus. And he has been exalted as ruler and savior. He is both the, the exalted kingly ruler and the savior, the one who redeems his people from their sins. This is who God is, and he offers salvation. Did you see that at the end of verse 31? That God has exalted this man to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Repentance and forgiveness is a beautiful way of describing what's on offer in salvation. That we can be forgiven as we repent and as we believe. The last important ingredient in Peter's brief speech here is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is uh, maybe the, one of the pulsating themes all throughout the book of Acts. Typically, this book is called the Acts of the Apostles. That's its official title that people gave, gave it a long time ago. But a number of folks have pointed out, maybe we should call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because it is the Holy Spirit who is living through the people of Jesus to accomplish this kind of life. And the Holy Spirit has been given by God to those who obey him. And Peter and the apostles said, we are witnesses of these things. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. They are witnesses of the fact that Jesus has been resurrected and exalted as ruler and as savior. And Peter says, look, you want to lock us up. You want to tell us not to speak the name. But we are witnesses of this thing. We are witnesses of these things. They're not denying that Jesus died. They were there on Good Friday. They were there in the terrible silence of Holy Saturday when nothing happened. They were just left with their doubt and despair. But they were also there on Easter morning. They said, we are witnesses of these things. When the Sanhedrin heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them, verse 33 says. But there was a Pharisee. Remember, he represents the minority faction on the Sanhedrin. But he's a very influential Pharisee. His name is Gamaliel. Now, we know from other parts of the Bible that Gamaliel uh, was the teacher of a guy named Saul of Tarsus. If that name is not familiar to you, Saul of Tarsus in a few chapters, is going to be introduced, and he's going to transform from being Saul of Tarsus to being Paul the Apostle. And he goes on this incredible road of transformation. But before Paul the Apostle was the famous apostle to the Gentiles, to people like us, before all of that, he was a student of a Pharisee named Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was a very respected and influential leader of the Pharisees, deeply committed to the law of God and to training people like Saul of Tarsus. And Gamaliel stood up. He said, send the prisoners outside so we can talk amongst ourselves. So the prisoners go out. And Gamaliel says, you know, we should be careful what we do here. I know you want to kill them. Because they have said, we have blood of God's son upon our hands. But what if we just let things play out and see what happens? And then he references a couple of historical events. A guy named Theudas, a guy named Judas. People who revolted against Rome. Tried to claim the mantle of Messiah. And lead, a, lead an uprising against Roman rule. He said, you know what came of those of those uprisings, nothing. Rome sent in the soldiers, and all of those guys are dead. Caesar is still Lord. He said, but if, 
if, if this guy, Jesus, is just like all those others, this movement, it'll die out. But if it's not like all the others, if it is different, if Jesus somehow is unique, if he really is the Messiah we've been waiting for all these years, then if we oppose the apostles, we will find ourselves in the scary position of fighting against God. He said, so maybe we should just let things play out. Let's see what happens. Gamaliel is not a Christian. I don't know if he ever became one. But he's given a lot of wisdom. I think it came from the Holy Spirit in this moment. And just like a, a broken clock is right twice a day, Gamaliel is right in his speech here. That if this movement is a fraud, it will peter out but if jesus is who he says he is something's going to come of this and we don't want to be on the wrong side of history gamaliel was right so they uh decide that they're not going to kill the apostles they beat them and tell them not to speak in the name of jesus the apostles have already told them they're not going to listen, but they tell them one more time, don't speak in this name, and then they send them out. And the apostles leave the presence of the Sanhedrin in verse 41, rejoicing because they're counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. Totally different response probably than the one I would have had. I would have been nursing my wounds, plotting my retribution, figuring out how I'm going to get even with the Sanhedrin. Not the apostles. They leave full of joy because they have suffered for the name. And every day in the temple and in various homes, they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. That name again, Jesus, is like a magnet that irresistibly draws them. They can't stop talking about the name. So what do we do with a passage like this? How do we apply it to us? Well, I began by talking about confidence and discouragement. So many of us have experienced our fair share of discouragement about church over the years. Some of us are new to church. Some of us have been around for a long time. Some of us some of us have been at one church for many years, and some of us have experienced a handful of churches. And we've all probably, if you've been at a church for a while, you've experienced disappointment. You've experienced discouragement. Because your brothers and sisters, surprise, surprise, are sinners. Just like you. And we bring our sin with us into the body of Christ. When we've experienced church hurt, when we've seen the darkness and the underbelly, sometimes we want to walk away. But Jesus is building his church yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He was building it in the first century in the midst of incredible persecution. And he's building it in the 21st century right here in Portland. We don't always know what we're doing. <laughs> we certainly don't know what's coming next. But Jesus does. And he is faithful to build his church. You see, CEC is not my church, it's not Pastor Ken's church, it's not the elders' church. This church belongs to Jesus Christ. It is his church. And he promised that he would build it and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. That is a promise from Jesus Christ. And it's one that you can bank on. If you've lost your confidence in church, I'd encourage you that now is the time to re-engage. The journey with Jesus is a communal journey. You see, we're just a band of pilgrims 
on a journey together towards the heavenly city. And it's a journey that we're meant to undertake together. Some of us, perhaps, were used to serving in the church, making a difference in the family of God. And then COVID happened. And then we got used to staring at our screens. And once we trickled back into church, we didn't quite know how to re-engage. We kept on being spectators, just like we were when we were at home, watching on our phones. If that's you, I'd say now's the time to re-engage with the people of God. Now's the time to move from being a spectator to a participator in this church. Some of us are just coming back, trying to figure out what we believe, uncertain about others because of all the church hurt, whether it's in this church or another church that you've experienced over the years, and you're trying to do this delicate dance of figuring out what you believe and how much you're willing to commit to your brothers and sisters. How vulnerable can we be? How honest and how open can we be? Dare we live like this? I would say that's the wrong question. The real question is, can we afford not to live like this? And I believe the answer is no. You see, we have to band together to live as God's people. Not because we have confidence in our pastors or in our programs, in our buildings, or in our budgets. No. We do this because Jesus is alive. And he is building his church yesterday, today, and forever. Let's pray. Jesus, I'm grateful that you build your church. Not me, not us. You build it. You care about it and are invested in it far more deeply than any of us. I pray that we would learn to love your bride. I know the church has many fallacies, many warts and wrinkles and imperfections. But I also know that you, Jesus, died for us, imperfect people that we are. You died to redeem a broken bride. You died to make us new. And I pray that your spirit would have its way at the conclusion of our service, that we would respond to your voice, that we would commit ourselves to you and to one another with a confidence that doesn't stem from impressive programs or polished pastors, but a confidence in the gospel because we serve you and you used to be dead and now you're alive. I pray that you would infuse us with that confidence and that that would change the way we live. In your name we pray, amen. Let's stand together to sing. Stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Took my 
is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty power and authority before all time now and forever amen and after a moment of silent meditation please 